All right, guys, um, we've been sharing the last few weeks about uh, why we believe in the Bible, why we reject certain Bibles, we embrace others. Um, we have, let me see here, how many books of your Bible do you have in your Protestant New Testament Bible? How many books? Come on, guys, how many books? <laughs> in the Protestant New Testament Bible, how many books do we have? In the Protestant New Testament Bible, which is what? I have a, a New American Bible uh, right here as I open it up. Listen, guys, and, and I'm, not, I'm not here making fun. I'm not here to be derogatory. Um, I want Christians to be aware. If you name the name of Christ, hello. If you name the name of Christ, we need to know what we believe and we need to know why we believe that. Hello. Are we okay? Right? Amen? We need to know what we believe and we need to know why we believe that. Because a lot of uh, traditions in Christianity holds some different views from us particular. We are four square. Um, I was joking this morning. I said, uh, uh, they said, Pastor, could you answer a question for us? And I said, sure. Uh, the question is probably why are women in leadership ministry in four square churches, right? You know, and I'm teasing. And they said, no, no, we've already answered that question. They had a different question. But there are churches who do not agree and do not believe that women should be in leadership of any kind. They should not stand behind the pulpit. Okay, we are not one of them. So why do we believe what we believe? How do we come to these conclusions? What's the difference between our denomination, uh, Foursquare doesn't even necessarily identify itself as a denomination. It identifies itself as a movement. Organic, it's moving. Not a denomination, rigid, set principles and concepts. We view ourselves as a, as a, a flow, fl fluid motion in the hands of the Lord. But we, first of all, our very first and core fundamental belief as a Foursquare church is we believe in the Bible. Okay? Because that is uh, the bedrock of our foundation. If it's not in the Bible, then, then we're not going to adhere to it. If it is in the Bible, we're going to adhere to that. We believe in Foursquare. We believe in Jesus as a healer. We believe that Jesus still does some miracles today. Hello? All right, now this is important. There are denominations who believe that God used to do some stuff. Really cool, but it's only in God's prerogative, up from heaven. He'll do some sprinkling here and there. You can't press in for faith. You can't do those things. We as Foursquare say, no, that we don't, we don't agree with that. Why? Because that's going outside of the Bible. That's leaning more toward experiences. And less on the word. So again, I'm asking the question, what's the difference between us here and churches in other areas or denominations in other places? What's the difference between what we believe and what I'm going to say, what other people who would name Christ, what they believe? Here in this town, in this community, we've been having uh, uh, people trying to peddle this new Sefer Bible. And I'm very on high alert about this. The reason is, is because it's embracing uh, books in the Bible that historically the church did not embrace. And now they have this new Bible. I'm asking the question, how many books are in our Protestant scriptures? Our Holy Bible, the Protestant Bible. It is 66. 27 in the Old Testament. Or excuse me, 27 in the, in the New Testament, thank you, and 39 in the Old Testament together combined is 66 books. Why do we say yes to this Bible, but we say no to other Bibles? This is the question that we're endeavoring to answer. This is the question for canonicity, okay? Um, I have with me right here. And again, we're not here to shame. We're not here to guilt trip. We're here to explain. We're here to learn. We're here to understand. Am I clear? If you disagree with me, let's talk. Let's, let's figure it out. If you say, Pastor, I believe in the Sefer Bible. I believe in the book of Enoch, Pastor, and I think you should too. Well, let's talk about this. 
Let's talk about the book of Enoch. Let's look into these things. Let's consider this. Well, pastor, I believe in the gospel of Thomas. I mean, for crying out loud, Thomas was a disciple. And he had a gospel story about Jesus too. And I believe that his story needs to be told. Okay. Let's talk about this. Let's not talk about because you feel like it should be included. It should be included. Let's go ahead and run it through some tests. Let's run it, interestingly enough, through the same test the early church ran it through. Okay, there were three tests in particular that we have looked about, looked at and considered. Um, we've, how did the early church pick and choose which ones belonged? Well, first of all, it wasn't them for picking and choosing. It was for them to discover which ones were legitimate? Which ones did God actually speak? If Mike and I, we come up here and we have a letter that we both feel is inspired of God, and then Evan comes up here as well, and he says, you know, the gospel according to Evan. We have the gospel according to Jimmy, and we have the gospel according to Mike. Okay? And we all have a gospel account, and, and one of us is an eyewitness to these things, what Jesus actually did and said then one of us is going to have a little bit more credibility. Does that make sense? But it doesn't disqualify the other two. So what are the qualifications for the other ones? How do we determine and decide? And, and interestingly, enough, uh, interestingly enough, it's not the other two that go under the scrutiny. It's all three. Just because you claim to be an eyewitness doesn't make it so. But even if you were an eyewitness, does it make it so? Just because I was there and I saw it, does that mean I'm, I'm, I'm writing by the inspiration of God? The answer is the daily double. No. <laughs> okay. No is the question. Or no is the, <laughs> the answer. What is the question? <laughs> um. At any rate, guys, so what we're looking at and trying to understand is why do we gravitate toward, why do we accept, why do we believe, and I say it again, the Protestant scriptures. I have right here, and I, again, I'm not here to, 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 to argue or debate or shame or guilt. I'm here for understanding, for learning. Okay, are we clear? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. Most of us are ready. Okay, there you go, Clint. Good job, buddy. All right. Uh, New American Bible. Has anybody heard of that? It says right on, on the thing, it says New American Bible for Catholics. Now, open up the page. I come to the index, the list, the contents. Here we go. I'm going to read the contents. Genesis. Do we have that? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. We're all good so far? 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. We're good? Tobit? Huh. Judith? No. Esther? Maccabees 1? Maccabees 2? Job? Psalms? Proverbs? Ecclesiastes? Song of Solomon? Wisdom? Sirach? Isaiah? Jeremiah? Lamentations, Baruch, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Joel, yes, come on guys, Protestant Bible, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Hebekek, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That list includes 46 Old Testament books. 46. How many is in R? 39. What's the difference? I don't know. What's seven? Okay, there you go. You're quick. <laughs> seven, is it? Uh, uh, 39 and 46. There you go. Seven. Seven is the difference. Interestingly enough, in the book of Daniel, there are three other books included. Um, uh, Bell and the Dragon, uh, the Songs of the Three Holy Children, and Songs of Susanna. So that adds another three books. In, in Daniel alone, in, in this book, in, in the Catholic Bible. Now, here's the question, guys. Why do we not embrace this? Why do we not embrace this? Why do we say yes to these others, the 66, but these seven, and then if you include the breakdown in Daniel, three, so 10, 
we don't accept, we don't embrace. This is a question for canonicity. So today I want to take, a t take some time. Now this is in the Old Testament, okay? And, and again, I'm not here to shame or to guilt trip. I know a lot of people have a Catholic background, and that's fine. That suits me just fine. The fact of the matter is, a lot of Christians have a Christian background. And they can't answer the same questions that neither the Catholics can, nor the Mormons can, nor the Jehovah Witnesses can, or the Seventh-day Adventist. They don't know what they believe. They don't know why they believe it. They have an inkling. Why do we only have 39 books in our Old Testament? We have an answer. I've already covered this. Perhaps I could provoke your thinking and remind you that during the time of Christ, these books were a part of the Greek Septuagint version. All of these 74 books, at the time of Jesus, there was a, they didn't call it an Old Testament. They called it the Scriptures. Okay? There was a Hebrew which the world had stopped pretty much speaking Hebrew. Now they're transitioning into Greek. And for some years now, like 200, 250 years, the world had been speaking Greek. So sometime before, about 200 years, I want to say, I can't remember for sure, don't quote me on that, but around 200 years before, these, these Greek-speaking Jews, they were Jews from Jerusalem, went all the way to Africa, to Alexandria, and they, they used, they updated the scriptures, okay, from Hebrew to the now spoken language of Greek. For some unknown reason, they rearranged the order of the Hebrew scriptures, the, the Torah, the law. Uh, they, they rearranged the order, and, and we have adopted in the Protestant Scriptures, we have adopted the order that they, that they reintroduced. That's the order that we see in the Scriptures. If we say, hey, name the, 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 the Old Testament, and you go Genesis, Exodus, and you end with Malachi. 39 books. The order was set by those guys, the 70 scholars. But what they also did at that time was they introduced a few others that were Jewish literature. They put them in the book, the, the scriptures. And perhaps they thought, hey, this would just be fun to add these things. These are wonderful stories. We don't, nobody takes them literally. Um, we don't embrace them as from God, but these are good. And so we want to include these in our scriptures. And so then, therefore, by the time of Christ, these things were a part of everyday common use. However, Jesus, the disciples, the apostles, the early church, none of them, even the Jewish scholars of the day, embraced these books as scriptural authority. They did not embrace them. But now we have a problem. They're still in the book. Well, by the time the New Testament starts to come about, they're adhering to the old, what we now call the Old Testament. It wasn't the Old Testament to them. It was called the Scriptures. Right? So now they're, they're, the New Testament is well underway. We've talked about how Paul the Apostle was out preaching about uh, uh, the righteousness of, of Christ by faith. The righteousness of God by faith, not of works. Nobody can boast, right? Ephesians chapter 4. For by grace we are saved through faith, not of works, you know, lest any man could boast. I'm totally butchering that scripture, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Is it 4? 2. 2, 9, and 10. Something like that. Anyways, well, it's in Ephesians. <laughs> Pastor, you're doing awesome. Paul preached justification by faith and faith alone. So when Paul is out there bringing converts, unbelievers, into, into the faith, into Christianity, to become disciples and followers of Christ, he's teaching that all you need to do is believe in Jesus. 
And then he'd take them out. They'd get them water baptized. He'd take them out. He'd, he'd lay hands on them. They'd get spirit filled. They all spoke in other tongues. This is his, his MO. Then other believers who also believed in Jesus came and said, hey, listen, you're, you're teaching these people wrong. They need to follow the law. They need to follow the, 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 the law of Moses. Big debate took place. They argued. They said, go back to Jerusalem, Mr. Paul, with all due respect. You need to get your doctrine figured out and ironed out. So he took the arduous journey, went back with Paul and Barnabas, went all the way back to Jerusalem. At each stop, at each town, at each province, he would come into and he would share the good news and encourage the believers there. When he finally makes it to Jerusalem, he said that the, the brothers and sisters, they all welcome him. Hey, church conference, the brothers are back. Let's, uh, let's just celebrate. Let's have a fellowship meal. And so everybody came out of the woodwork. They're all happy, right? Well, Paul is telling them, listen, God is showing up. There's miracles. There's wonders. Yay! Where miracles, wonders, and signs. Yay! Healing's taking place. Yay! There was this time where I was preaching. A guy in the back, I felt like he, he has faith to be healed. I said, stand up. And he did. And he embraced Jesus. And the, the whole town was rocked. And there was other times where they stoned us and kicked us out of town, stuff like that, right? And they're like, oh man, that's so awesome. You're just out there serving God. He said, and then the brothers came and they, you know, come in to encourage us. And they're telling us that we need to follow Moses. And the, but, but God himself is confirming that that's not true because we're seeing the miracles, wonders, and signs. And, and they're getting filled with the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said, it's impossible for the world to get filled. You have to be a new creation in Christ. So if God is acknowledging them, then why are we trying to put rules over them? And they're, oh, time out, buddy, time out. Yeah, no, that, see, that's where you're wrong, Paul. Your doctrine is messed up. And other people, no, listen, li did you not hear him? He's got a great point. And they're transitioning from Old Covenant to New Covenant. And there's some things that they're trying to figure out. And so what do they do? They end up listening to what Peter has to say. They're listening to what James is saying. But they end up taking it before the Lord. Lord, what, what about this? You're not schizophrenic. You're, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, there's no shadow of turning. So what's going on here, Father, Lord God? Show us, teach us. What do we do? We submit to you, your will, your, your word, your ways. And they're starting to see in the scriptures that this was the plan of redemption all along, that mankind was not capable and adequate to achieve salvation through works, that they needed a Savior. Even if you shut yourself away, lived the life of a monk your entire life, and you didn't ever kiss, kick your cat or, 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 or curse or step on a Lego and find yourself uttering syllables that you shouldn't, right? <laughs> you, you, you're actually living a pretty good life and you're doing everything that you can to, to honor the poor and to honor your parents and to follow the, the Ten Commandments. You're doing everything that you can. And so, therefore, I must be right before God, right? You know, we're tipping the scales. And the fact of the matter is, we're finding out, no, we're not good enough, that we do need a Savior. We need Jesus. Well, okay, so I embrace Jesus and keep doing good works, right? Paul's saying, no, because that's to accept Jesus is to denounce yourself and your good works. So if you're going to embrace him, embrace him. And don't try to be good, just be good. And you being good is not what's getting you into heaven. It's Jesus who gets us in. And then we're good as a result of a new nature, a new creation. Okay? So this debate's taking place. They're figuring these things out. They're leaning into God. They're looking into the scriptures, the 39 books, not the 47 books or 49, whatever. In this, in this one, it was 43, but then you add those other three. Uh, whatever it is, whatever. At any rate, 10, ten more books. So um, they're navigating into the New Testament. Now, here's the thing. They end up agreeing, the entire church ends up agreeing with the Apostle Paul and his doctrine. 
and they send letters to the churches, and they send witnesses to these letters that they testify. Paul didn't just write this and said, hey, from Jerusalem church. You know, Paul's right. <laughs> he doesn't just write some letter. They actually send witnesses, people that they would recognize. Hey, I remember him when he was out with the crusade with, with Peter, and he was out here, you know, um, the whole city of Samaria, say, they saw Paul. Peter and John, they came out. The Holy Spirit was ministered. Simon the sorcerer, remember him? He's right there still, you know, and he's chilling. And, and he accepted Jesus, and then he still had some, some stuff. He had a business he had to work through with the Lord, you know. Not to point him out, but right. And, and, and they're saying, yeah, uh, okay, we, we acknowledge Paul. We acknowledge his doctrine. We acknowledge that he's legitimate. Well, this is, this is awesome because Paul at this point in time started writing these letters. And, in, and letters of encouragement. And he would feel like, I feel like, ah, oh, gosh, man, Corinth. That's like Helper, you know? Or Wellington or East Carbon. It's, they're out there a little ways. But they're out there a long ways. You know what I'm saying? And, and I feel that East Carbon, East Carbon. <laughs> they're really out there, okay? This is Castle to Hell. And I feel like, you know, I feel just so, I love these guys, but they're going to miss the boat on some things. And I want to see that they follow God. So God, what do you want me to say? How can I say, Father, use me. Use my talents, my skills, my abilities. I want to speak life into your people. Father, let this be you and not me. So he take it upon himself to write these letters inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. He, he, he writes these letters, and they start passing them out to the church. And then he tells the church of Corinth, hey, listen, uh, that letter I wrote to you, go ahead and share it with, with the church of Ephesus. And make sure that Laodicea gets a copy. In other words, hey, listen, East Carbon, uh, make a copy. You don't have a Xerox, but, you know, write it down um, and send it back to Helper. And, and can, you, can you make sure that Castle Dell gets in on this too? Because if it's, if it's from God... It's for his people, then it's for his people. Not just, no, you. Okay, it's for, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander kind of a thing. So here we have the formation beginning of the, what we now call the New Testament. Here we go. This is an excerpt from Haley's Bible Handbook. Do you guys have your Bibles? You're going to need them. Uh... I'm going to throw out some scriptures real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Revelation chapter 1, Colossians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 5. I know I'm going fast. Um, I need you guys to look at, we don't all have to look at the same ones, but let's at least grab a couple. So um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, raise your hand. Uh, Shanda, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Billy, uh, Revelation chapter 1, we looked at that one last week. Um, we'll grab that one again, Revelation chapter 1. Okay. And then Colossians chapter 4. There you go. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Who had 1 Thessalonians 2? 1 Thessalonians, that's Billy, uh, chapter 2. Also be on deck for chapter 5. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Clint? Um, and Second Peter, chapter one. Okay, all right. I'm going to read this, um, and then we're going to stop and pause and look at these scriptures. Okay. How we got the Bible. This is an excerpt from Haley's Bible Handbook, page seven forty one through seven forty two. Uh, how we got the Bible, the formation of the New Testament. This is where we are. The New Testament canon, the word canon literally means cane or rod of measurement. In Christian use, it came to mean the written rule of faith. Or I, I keep saying this, the sta sta standard. Good job. The standard. Okay. Uh, the written rule of faith, that is the list of original and authoritative books that composed God's inspired word. 
the canonical, the canonical New Testament books were those which came to be generally recognized by the churches as the genuine and authentic writings of apostolic authority. In the days of Christ, there was in the literatures of the Jewish nation a group of writings called the Scriptures, now called the Old Testament, which the people commonly regarded as having come from God. They called it the Word of God. Jesus himself so recognized it. It was read publicly and taught regularly in the synagogues. Christian churches from the very first expected these, uh, excuse me, accepted these Jewish scriptures as God's word. And they gave them in their assemblies the same place they had in their synagogues. So in other words, what the Jews did in their, in their synagogues, their houses of worship, the position that the sacred scriptures held. This is the ultimate position. This is the Jews in their synagogue. This is the ultimate position, the sacred scriptures. Okay? The Christians in the New Testament adapted the same practice. But it's not a synagogue. It's called a, a church or a church assembly. Okay? In their assemblies... In their churches, they recognize these as the word of God. Are we clear? Uh, They gave them in their assemblies the same place they had in the Jewish synagogues. Uh, As the writings of the apostles appeared, they were added to these Jewish scriptures and were held in the same sacred regard. Each church wanted not only what had been addressed to itself, but copies of writings addressed to the other churches. The New Testament begin, beginnings of the canon. There are hints in the New Testament itself that while the apostles were yet living and under their own supervision, collections of their writings, their letters, began to be made for the churches and placed with the Old Testament as the Word of God. Paul claimed for his teaching, listen guys, this is vital. Paul's about to make a claim for his teachings. He's te- he, he, he makes the claim, this is from God. Kind of like what the Old Testament would say, thus saith the Lord. In other words, this has a position of authority that nothing else does. Now this is important. He's either true or he's wrong. He's false. Right? Question. Do people today say things like, thus saith the Lord? Or the Lord's telling me. Absolutely, guys. Come on. Let's be serious. Let's be real. Yeah, and it did happen. One of them was, was uh, it was a kind of a long term. One of the prophets uh, were s- standing up saying, Thus saith the Lord, and they're saying, you know, peace and safety, all is well. God's going to show up. We're going to be safe. They're being surrounded. And Jeremiah comes in and says, No, we're in trouble. We've screwed up. We've been worshiping false gods, and God's kind of ticked off. And if we do not repent, then we're going to be destroyed. And the people are like, no, the other prophet said so. You know, this guy said, thus saith the Lord too. You know, you know he's right because he said, thus saith the Lord. 
And, and, and Jeremiah's like, listen, dude, because you're saying this and you're prophesying lies, you're not going to live another year. This time, a year from now, you're going to be dead. Well, what do you do with that kind of prophecy? Oh, stone Jeremiah. Well, they couldn't stone him. They, they, they actually threw him into a cistern that was not dried up. It was full of mud. The Bible says that he was up to his neck in mud. And they held him in a, as a prisoner in a tank full of mud. They did that for days. Can you stand for days? I can. No, that would suck. Okay, I got something in my eye. I can't do nothing about it. <laughs> right? That would be awful. Well, that's kind of a long-term prophecy. You got a year. But when it happened, then they're like, oh, crud. Maybe he is actually speaking for God because what he's saying is coming to pass. He also made some prophecies that he could not, that they could not verify. For instance, when he says things like, hey, in 70 years, God's going to release you to come back from, from captivity. Well, they can't verify that. Well, hold on. We'll come back to you in 70 years. Is the mud okay? Is it okay? Do you want us to warm it up? Well, forget it, pal. No, they can't do that. Well, what about messianic prophecies? Well, that didn't happen for hundreds of years. So they couldn't verify these things. But they held them in question. And when they did see what he was saying come to pass, they started to embrace that. Okay? So now Paul is making, he's going to make some claims. We're going to look at this. He's going to make some claims saying, I'm speaking by the Lord's authority. This is what God is, is saying to, to y'all, to the churches. Now, people are doing the same things today, and they're saying some wacky things, things that the Lord is not saying. So who do, you know, in some cases, you got to wait and see if it comes to pass. When they say, President Trump, he's going to win, and, and he's going to be leading, you know, never exiting the White House kind of a thing. Well, okay, you can argue, and, and I've seen it. Well, President Trump did win. Okay, you're right. But he also left the White House. So you were wrong. Can we, can we judge this? Yes. Should we judge this? Yes. There's quote unquote modern day prophets that are saying some stuff. And as we're watching things unfold, what they're saying is not quite what we're seeing and experiencing. So the question is, do people still do this today? The answer is yes. When Paul did this, there were people that said, you're wrong. But he went back he got the arrest of the apostles on board. He didn't try and, you know, win them. They had to experience and navigate this for the, to the Lord themselves. What did they do? They started praying about it and considering the scriptures that they did have. They started looking at and considering what Jesus had taught them. And so now they're coming to the conclusion, you know what? Paul actually did hear accurate, accurately. He did hear from God. And we kind of been the stick in the mud here. We need to go ahead and release him. Let him go. Let him preach. He's, he's doing it right. Now, Paul is writing these letters, and he's making a claim. Okay, you guys ready? Shanda, you are the first one. All right. Paul claimed for his teachings, for his letters, for his doctrine, he claimed the inspiration of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Verses 7 through 13, please. Oh, let me have you hold this. Do we got another microphone? Yes, yeah, 7 through 13, here. You really have to speak in that? Yeah, because they're recording it. Dang you should have read that before you read it. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got okay. no, the wi- Here's two, seven through 13. Yes, so, no, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world <coughs> have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. This is what the scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. 
for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? He says, we're not speaking by man's wisdom, by man's authority, by man's words. We're speaking by God's. What is he claiming in that? He's claiming the inspiration of God. Turn to chapter 14, verse 37. I'll read that one. It's only one verse, so I'm good to go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Chapter 14, verse 37 says, um, If you claim to be a prophet or think that you are spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord himself. Oop, excuse me. Is that is that not a day? You know the uh, the audacity, the boldness to claim to speak for God. Can you believe that guy, that Paul, the Apostle Paul? But yet the apostles embraced him and embraced his teachings. All right. How about First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen, Billy? <coughs> For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Did you catch that? He said our message, our gospel message, it's not our message. It came from God. Our message is God's message. The authority that we're speaking on is on behalf of God himself, right? Book of Revelation, uh, chapter, uh, Reve chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, that was Anastasia. Hold on a second. Uh, would you bring that up to Miss Anastasia? What's your key point? That's, a, that's one of the tests. Remember, when we were looking at uh, the test that, that when they were dis, you know, discovering which of the New Testament letters, books, which were from God. The test was, does, uh, well, in, in, oh, golly, there's three mentioned in that book, The Doctrine of the Black One. And then there's five actually mentioned in uh, Josh McDowell's book. When the early church, when the early Christians, the first one was, did this come from an apostle? Did this come from an eyewitness? And if not an eyewitness themselves, somebody directly working with an eyewitness, for instance, who was not an eyewitness, who wrote one of the four Gospels? Mark and Luke. They were not eyewitnesses, but they were working directly with the apostles. Right? Mark's gospel was actually Peter telling Mark, write this down. I want to share my letter. Okay? I want to, I want to send a gospel message so that the churches, the, the believers, will know what Jesus said, what he did, what he taught. I was there. Write this down. Okay? So that's Mark's gospel. Matthew was there. John was there. Mark wasn't. But yet the church embraced him. Why? Because it fell into the category of the very first screening test, if you would. The next one was, um, one, one of them is, does this have the power to transform lives? That's what Billy just read. That's what we just read in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, John, okay, so that's Paul. Paul claimed that he was writing with the authority of God and the words of God. John claimed the same thing in Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. Read that for us, please, Anastasia. Just, well, well, just two it says, but okay. two and three works. Who bore witness to the word of God and so the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw? Okay, hold on. John is saying, I bore witness 
to what? The Word of God. I saw these things, and I'm telling you what he just told me to tell you. Is that making sense? We've got to hurry up. Paul also, at, who has Colossians chapter 4? Uh, Jay. Paul intended that his epistles, his letters, should be read in the churches. Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Who's on deck with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Billy. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Clint. Okay. So Billy, then Clint. Go ahead. Uh, read uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, Jay. After you have read this letter, pass it on to the church at La Halasita. Laodicea. Laodicea. So that they can read it, too. And you should read the letter I wrote to them. Oh, my goodness. So now we have the Apostle Paul saying, share these letters. Okay, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27. 1 Thessalonians 5, 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Is Paul wanting his message to get out there? 2 Thessalonians, right here at Clint, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep strong grip on the teachings we passed on to you both in person and by letter. Stay with these letters. Share them. Stick with them. You've seen it. You've heard it. We've written you letters. You've read it. Stay with what God has given us. Stay with what God has given you. Okay, now here's the thing. We've got we to finish up. Um, they are claiming for the New Testament. How did the New Testament even come about? They're claiming that they're speaking for God. They're being recognized by the other disciples, now apostles, as this is legitimately from God. Now, they're saying, brothers and sisters, you need to share this. You need to share it. You need to spread it. Are we starting to see how the New Testament came about? So, if this is what's taking place at the very beginning of Christianity, while the apostles were still alive, how come two and three hundred years new gospels are popping up that have absolutely ridiculous notions, and yet Christians today, today, in our community, are saying, yeah, no, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I mean, it totally paints Jesus as a polygamist and, 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 and just a liar. But hey, it's cool, right? Because it's a gospel. And it was by Mary. And it's 2,000 years old. You know? And it's really, really old. So therefore, it must be true. And I'm saying, guys, come on, wake up. Wake up. Let's stick with what we know. Let's actually find out what we know. Let's rediscover. Why do we reject certain books but embrace others? Well, here's why. We're learning. We're growing. All right, God bless you. We will hopefully make it further next week. <laughs> Let's get ready for worship.